Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Brown, Hillier Director. Welcome to our Zoom conversation with this month's featured artist, Jeremy Jersa, Lynn Oliva Lilly, and Heather Goodchild. Uh, I'm also joined by Cassandra Bartlett, who is the lead gallery assistant at Hillier, uh, who also introduced the artist, and gallery assistant Amity Chen, who will monitor the chat during our conversation. Jeremy and Lynn. Jeremy, Lynn, and Heather are the last three artists from the 2020 call for proposals to be featured this year. So I'm actually very excited to have them here today. I also want to take this time to recognize our sponsors, the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts. So let's get started. Uh, join me in giving a raised hand welcome to Cassandra, who will introduce today's featured artists. Thanks, Tim. Um, yes, it's my pleasure to introduce these artists. It was such a joy getting to work with each of them during their installations and get to learn more about them. So I'm excited for these opportunities when everybody else can get to know them and appreciate them just as much as we do. Um, so to start off, um, our first artist speaking today is going to be Jeremy Jersa. Jeremy is a multidisciplinary artist. He's based in multi, um, Baltimore, Maryland, um, and he's shown across the East Coast and also in Florence, Italy. So today he'll be speaking to you about his exhibit currently at Hillier called Gray Area. So please join me in welcoming Jeremy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I A&A Hillier, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, so to begin, I'm going to start with a sharing my screen, uh, going into a little bit of a slideshow about my work. Um, can everyone hear me, by the way? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, we're good on that. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Um, so I want to start with a little bit of backstory about my work and how I got to where I am today. Um, so I want to start with a little story about a mentor I had in grad school, his name was Matt Friedman. And when I came into grad school, I was making these very heavy, very dark um, paintings. I was looking at Francis Bacon as kind of like a god and, and going into these really dark painterly with a capital P paintings. And we were having a conversation in my studio one day about why does the work have to be so heavy? Why does it have to be so depressing? You're, you're not necessarily coming across as this very dark, heavy guy. You, you, you poke jokes, you, you have fun. Um, there, there are other aspects to you other than just this dark, depressing aspect of your life. So why does it need to always be so heavy handed? Um, so from there, I started to think about that very wholeheartedly. And I went into trying to introduce some dark comedy into my work. And in order to do that, I started to think about memories that kind of encapsulated these, these different feelings that I was exploring within my own practice. And within my own practice, I, I focus a lot on my, my Tourette's and my OCD and, and how that, that trauma has affected my life. Um, so I chose a, a single memory where I first kind of started to realize where I was dealing with this, these issues and this depression. And I went back to a memory with my mom. And every time I left the house in the morning when I was a kid, she would always say, have a nice day, have a nice day, have a nice day. And I would never reply with, oh, you too, or um, I love you, have a nice day, or anything. I would just say, I'll try. And for me, that became a really big kind of moment and symbolizer of the acknowledgement of the fact that I knew I was not happy and I knew that I was going to be struggling with a lot throughout that day. And, and this memory comes from elementary school. So that was just kind of a, that first poignant moment for me that I could recognize this aspect of my life. Um, so I then took that idea and I started to run with it. And it was a year after grad school, I was working as an art handler between Philadelphia and New York. And I saw one of these that are on the screen, the, the takeaway bags, you can get at any uh, fast food restaurant, just kind of blowing across the street, almost like a, like a urban tumbleweed, if you will. And it has this smile. It, it's always telling you to have a nice day, enjoy yourself, but yet we don't know what's happening on the inside of this bag. And it became kind of this tragic figure because it's, it's meant to be disposed of, it's meant to be thrown away, um, but yet it's always going to be showing this smile. So I, I thought to myself, well, how can I use that? 
So in my earlier works, I started to just kind of paint very naively and then still bring in this idea of Trump Loy, bringing in this, this post-it note that you see down here at the bottom. It's a very poor quality photo, old work. Um, but I saw the bag itself as a, a stand-in for the, the human body and this idea of presence and absence that's still asserting itself in terms of a smile. Um, and then the little post-it note at the bottom, while playing with these ideas of Trump Loy and, excuse me, these ideas of Trump Loy and these ideas that um, you're confronting the surface and facade and, and what's being shown and what's not being shown, it also says, I'll try in my handwriting on that post-it note. So bringing in that idea of have a nice day, I'll try. And then how can I expand and kind of build with that? So the work itself then started to play with, with this bag. How can, I, how can I explore this bag? How can I continue to use this within my work? And then furthering that idea of Trump Loy. So then taking away that smiley face, using it as a motif to expand within the work itself. So moving on to gray area, I wanna read just a little write up that I have for the show um, and then expand on that just slightly. So bear with me for a moment. Um, gray area is defined as an ill-defined situation or field not readily conforming to a category or to an existing set of rules. The difference between medicine and poison is dosage and intent. By analyzing the socioeconomic factors that produced the blue collar veil through which I interpreted the world in adolescence and young adulthood, I explore my relationship with PTSD, mental illness, self-medication, and the space between old habits and learned behaviors. The relationship that stems from my reaction to bouts with Tourette's, severe OCD, anxiety, and depression, ultimately leading to an overwhelming performance of facade to the world through a smile while suffering in secret. So in this show itself, I really wanted to focus on that space in between, not, not just focusing on the emotive qualities of um, the, the, the depression and the anxiety, but also what I would do to force that facade, what I would do to kind of protect myself in terms of medicating to get through um, that Tourette's and, and all the fallout from those traumas. So in the work, we can see there are performance aspects where I'm, I'm really trying to push that physical element of the work. I'm always exploring the relationship between painting and sculpture. Um, if I start to create a painting, sometimes I'll even try to then make that become a reality in terms of a, a sculpture itself. So we can see over here in the back right, we have Pity Party, which is a, a fun piece where I, I kind of throw a pity party for myself, this, this sad self-deprecating area. And then I have this little uh, guest list on the wall where no one's going to come. So it's this very isolating moment, but still poking fun at myself. Um, and then taking that idea of that balloon and then translating that, 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 that smile, that, that inflated piece into a, a physical element that I can then have sit in the gallery and have you consume that. And then that has a conversation with the paintings again, because then I go back and make paintings of those sculptures. So there's this constant dialogue between, between the work and I, I see them all as, as speaking to each other, not just one facet of my, my practice. Um, this piece specifically, uh, False Posture, within this work, I'm thinking about the balloon as a metaphor for the human body. It, it, it takes in breath, it has life, it floats, it moves on its own independently of the world. But yet there are these extraneous factors that are constantly pulling it down. Eventually it starts to sag and the gravity will bring it down to the ground while it's still inflated. But yet whatever image is on it, such as this, I, I pulled that smiley face from that have a nice day takeaway bag. And it's still confronting the world and protruding this, this smile saying, I am still happy even though all of this is going on. And, and it's this false sense of uh, excitement almost. And then here, once again, we have Pity Party, which is in the exhibit, a uh, gray area where throwing a kind of self-deprecation party for yourself, having a guest list on the wall, no one's on the guest list. So how you sulk in those feelings and kind of poking fun at myself through these um, traumas and, and, and moments where I know it was extremely heavy, but let's laugh about it before anyone else can make fun of me for it. That kind of uh, defense mechanism 
that, that used to come up in my past, I try to bring into the work itself. So still focusing on this kind of adolescent, um, young adulthood filter through a lot of my practice. Um, and then it even goes into other factors of my life, such as love, um, playing with ideas of cliche, since I have this giant smiley face that's coming out into all of these factors. I now have um, this neon heart that I bent that's still playing with Trump Loy. So the wires look as though that they're compressing this balloon. The balloon looks as though it's a real balloon, but it's not. There are little, what I call little fuck ups within the painting itself that allow you to remind yourself that it's a painting. Um, but yet we have this heart that's pulling down this balloon. So playing with that cliche, thinking to myself, I'm bound by this idea that I may never find a partner because I put so much pressure on myself in terms of these ailments that I have, in terms of the OCD and the Tourette's. How can I ask someone to love me with those ailments if I'm still having trouble loving myself through those experiences? And then furthering that idea of wordplay, that have a nice day, how that, that has that duality within a lot of the work. I now have this piece that's playing with that trump loy that looks like it's tape kind of falling off, slapping up this deflated balloon with a smiley face on this panel. Um, but yet this piece is called Happy Hour on Saturdays, spelled S-A-D-D-E-R. Um, so, so once again, playing with those dualities and, and poking fun through that kind of dark comedy. And then once again, not taking it too seriously, but still talking about serious elements. Um, so this is called vice grip. So when you have a vice grip, it's, it's something that's not coming off. It's, it's so tight, um, but it's a shadow of myself reaching for this beer can that used to be this heavy, heavy vice for me. So it's, it's, it's identifying that, that past self and, and how that relationship is interacting. And then here, once again, playing with those shadows, uh, self-portrait and this idea of presence and absence, this piece is called shadow self. So it's a self-portrait, but it's a cast shadow within this black and white rigid line and how these blending, uh, this blending of those worlds or lines actually come together in terms of dosage, medication, self-medication, um, all reflected within um, this, this past memory of, of who I once was. And then once again, moving into bringing the sculpture itself into the paintings. And this was one of my first paintings I've ever made with airbrush. And it was a new technique for me. And it was exciting to kind of try and learn. And I'm always open to new techniques within my practice. So here, this piece is called Farsighted um, because I was only in those moments looking for what could take this pain away, but not looking at the immediate effects of, of that response. So everything in the foreground is very blurry, while in the background, everything is kind of crystal clear and, and playing with that, that black and white tile. This is a very, very emotive piece for me. Um, this, this piece stems out of, um, one of my lowest points in, in my life and a, and a real turning point for, for myself. I was in grad school. Um, I was extremely depressed and, and trying to cope and not understanding what was happening with me or around me. And I was drinking heavily and not really thinking clearly. So one night I was like, this is it. I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. So I called my mom and I left a suicide note on her voicemail. Um, luckily, I had passed out that night before I could do any extreme harm to myself. Um, but I woke up to my mom and dad who drove through the night to try and save me. Um, so woke up to them coming into my apartment, waking me up and just feeling the, the shame of, of that experience. And then the next day, I ended up um, going into therapy for the first time in my life um, and then also joining a rugby team, which ended up helping quite a bit. You know, rugby is the sport where everyone has a place and I, I didn't feel as though I had a place in the world. So it was a very accepting experience. Um, but this piece in general is called Morning Sun. So once again, playing with that I, duality of words, um, morning spelt as if you're mourning for someone and sun spelt S-O-N. 
So the balloon itself is rising. So it's rising through this, this depressed element. And I like to see myself as something that still rose after that aspect, after that trauma, after that moment. So, so this piece is once again, that representation of presence and absence within um, what, what could have happened. And then this goes into, this is a still from one of the performances that I, I've done recently, um, where I'm physically putting myself through um, elements that I would put myself through on a, on a daily basis to, to numb those factors, to numb the Tourette's, to numb the OCD, to, to, to not think about the depression. And what I found is that I really wanted to keep it within this language of painting. So I wanted to control everything within my setup, everything within um, the, the picture frame itself. So still reasserting that picture plane. Um, so if we look to the left, we see this um, vase that I made that replicates Vincent van Gogh's sunflowers. So playing on that, that trope of that mental illness, taking the paps um, container and making it look as though it's painted. Same thing with all the cans, painting them individually. Um, choosing a background and colors that were representative of the um, basements that I would kind of hang out in in high school. Um, and then through my performance, there is a projection within this frame that's not evident here, um, but there's a projection of Caravaggio's Bacchus. And through the performance, it starts off very blurry. And then as the performance moves on, it starts to crystallize and it becomes clearer. So the act of drinking, the act of binge drinking became this offering to Bacchus to, to heal myself, the God of wine and pleasure, please take, take this pain away. Um, and that then leads me to kind of my love of art history, which, which plays a great factor into a majority of my work. Um, and I started looking and fixating on the, this painting by Picasso. And I thought, well, how can I how can I bring this into my practice? And um, medical marijuana has become a great, great help to me, stabilizing my Tourette's, stabilizing my anxiety and depression. So it helps me more than any medication. Um, in the past three years, I started seeing an actual um, Tourette's doctor who was putting me on all these medications to try and stop it. And I was just getting sick and sick and sick and, and feeling absolutely horrible. And then we tried uh, going the medical marijuana route and it really just started to help me through every aspect of that Tourette's, of that OCD, of that anxiety, of that depression. Um, so I then took this painting, Boy with a Pipe, and then I made my own. Um, so it's man with a pipe and dog. So it's this ritual aspect of smoking a little bit every night so that those chemicals can carry over to the next morning and then I'm not necessarily ticking as much as I am normally. Um, and it helps me through a lot of those things. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's my spiel, if you will. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and just for the audience, I know he and the other artists are going to offer amazing insights and little tidbits that you might have questions for. Um, just as a reminder, we ask that you save them till the end. Or if you don't want to forget it, go ahead and message Amity in the chat and she will gather up all those questions for our designated Q&A at the end, because um, honestly, it just is so worth it asking them more about all their amazing pieces. Um, so thank you again, Jeremy. Uh, next up, I would like to introduce Lynn Oliva Lilly. Lynn is an American photographer. She's actually based um, locally in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, her work has been exhibited both nationally and internationally. So today she will be sharing her journey and her photography um, that's currently on display at Hillier through her exhibit, Earthbound. So without further ado, Lynn. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Tim, Cassie, and Amity, and Hillier Gallery. Um, it's a great honor and privilege to be able to exhibit with you. And I really appreciate the help with hanging the show. You did a great job. Um, I'd like to start also with a little bit of my background um, that led me to where I am now. Um, and uh, I'd like to mention that my father was a scientist, biologist, and my mother is a painter. And I had no idea that later on in life, I would be 
turning to photography and being influenced by both both parents, but of course it makes total sense. Um, so we as a family had been moving back and forth internationally from uh, Silver Spring, Maryland to um, uh, Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan the first time, and then back here, and then to Amman, Jordan for a few years, then back here, and then back to Kyrgyzstan for two years, and then back. So I really felt that um, photographing was a way for me to adapt to a new place and to allow my inner life to have some sort of collaboration with the outer world. Uh, so in every place that we lived, including now here, uh, I photograph long-term projects that evolved over time. So I never really had a plan except that I need to get out and see the world and figure out how do I live uh, in this place and also how are my, uh, how's my inner life going to be uh, um, renewed and restored through the process. Um, so, but what I was really focusing are photo books. That's what I love. And that's um, the, the, my preferred uh, way of presenting my work because it's um, over time and you can have many more photographs in a book. It's more intimate. Uh, the viewer can sit at home and take their time in quiet. Um, so I really love that whole experience. And I've never really focused on exhibitions until um, this opportunity with Hilliard came along. And plus with moving a lot, I had to decide and having two children, what do I want to focus my energies on? And for me, it was photographing and the book and that was plenty. Um, uh, so I never really could conceive of my work in a space. Um, uh, like, so um, when the opportunity came along, I thought, um, yes. And in fact, um, I had proposed originally a different body of work that I made in Jordan that became my first book, Tender Mint. Uh, and then when, when COVID hit, everything was shut down and we were asked again, when you reopen, how to or would we like to exhibit again? I said, yes, but I'd like to exhibit uh, this body of work that I've been doing for over a seven year period here in Silver Spring. It was closer to home. It seemed right given COVID and given the fact that we were back uh, for a few years. Um, so this is, um, the title is Earthbound and I kind of came to that later in the process. Um, titles are always, for me, come from reading. Uh, I, at a certain point, I start reading uh, in my creative process. Um, and this term earthbound seemed to have multiple interpretations. Um, so we are bound to this earth, earth having to face a reality and earth itself is bound in the universe. Bound can be a journey. We're moving through time and space. Uh, so I thought that felt right for what I was doing in the woods here in Sligo Creek. Um, the way this body of work happened was I was back home and I thought I have to get out and photograph. So I just walked across the street to Sligo Creek Woods, which is literally right here. And I started walking and then I saw it was in winter. I saw this amazing winter light falling on brambles. And it, there were these silver, red, and light brown colors. And I immediately thought, this is possibility. I need to follow this. So I started pho photographing more and more and this sense of weaving came into um, the work. And I'd like to just show, this is sort of what I saw, um, not on that day, but in, um, maybe even a couple of years later. Uh, and it just was so hopeful to me uh, that I wanted to continue and I became obsessed with brambles. Um, and that obsession then, uh, it was really line and light and color. And, and it just led me to all kinds of surprises um, in the woods and paths. So I would follow footpaths and then, um, deer paths. And finally, I would find something like, like a deer carcass, which, you know, was totally unexpected. Um, 
And I liked how the lines kind of mimicked the brambles. Uh, and the, this feeling of connection with nature and connecting with what I was seeing became very important and how that evolved over time was this a result of this collaboration of the questions I was asking internally and what I was seeing out in the woods. Um, let's see. Um, another obsession became tendrils and this feeling of reaching and grasping and holding on and clasping and letting go. Again, with always this light present. Um, and, you know, I must have thousands of photographs of, of tendrils and how they change over the seasons. Um, so this concept of time and change also included. Then came these um, moments with uh, human presence that was also unexpected. Um, the moment I was actually following deer, photographing them, and they led me to this place where it looked like people had been practicing some sort of strange pagan ritual. And this uh, string tied to the tree underneath it, you can't see it, but you'll see the letter H. I purposely didn't continue. I mean, I have photographs of this with the word hell that was carved into the tree underneath. Um, but I just felt that it was more important to suggest that and just focus on the, the wetness underneath the string, the dryness in between and the light and the darks. Um, this human presence there that is kind of foreboding um, the darkness in the woods, the woods historically that can be dangerous uh, with fairy tales and also historical um, incidents here in the US. Um, I felt it was important to include these things. Um, the other human presence photograph that I have in the exhibition is a fishing lure. And I do remember being on the other side of the stormwater pond where this was taken, looking and seeing a line, like a string, actually a fishing line, but it, I thought it was some huge spider that had spun a, an amazing spider web somewhere. And when I got to the other side, I saw the lure and I thought, oh, of course, you know, but the way the color is mimicked in both the context and the fishing lure, the light coming through and the line and the color just seemed to me to, uh, to capture at the feelings of um, complicated life and yet hopefulness. Um, and again, the human presence. The, um, this one is, uh, Winter Hope, and I remember being on the path in winter, the snow had been on the ground and something was twinkling in the distance. And I just, I, it made me turn my head and I saw this color and I thought, what is this? So I got closer and closer and realized it was just the prism of a light coming through a um, frozen raindrop. And that just, seemed to me a signal, a sign of hope within, uh, within life. Um, we get also the, the blue heron or the gray heron actually um, kind of standing as a sentinel at the stormwater pond, intentionally blurred um, and uh, overseeing the whole, the whole situation. Um, I'm not really showing these in the um, way that they are in the exhibition. Um, it's more sort of thoughts about each one uh, as we go through them. This one is in fall and um, the, again, line, light, color and form and how to use selective focus in a way that really uh, brings your eye to the line and the light but then allows you to then explore the photograph and, and feel it as a whole. Um, what I wanna say about these kind of wanderings is that over time, um, I realized I was photographing in a fairly defined geographical area and it would take me two and a half to three hours to comfortably walk 
the paths and then the deer paths and then through brambles off the beaten path along the creek. It would take me about two and a half, three hours to do that. And over time, I found these places that really resonated with me. So I would go back every day, every season to photograph them, see what was new, see what had changed. Um, and it became a meditative process. And through that, these surprises were able to happen. Um, so this is one of a more realistic photograph of the winter path, a winter path that I would walk and then, then walk off to the side to find the deer because I know where the deer go. Um, and these places within this geographical area, it's probably only a fourth of a mile or half a mile at the most, but it really gave me a deep sense of, of place and connection and a relationship with the place. Um, layers upon layers of discovery and meaning that um, didn't answer questions, but just made me feel alive and hopeful. Um, so these spider webs, I think it happened in March. I'd never seen them before. This was more recently that I photographed them. They just appeared over the water. Um, there had been a tree that had fallen uh, in the stormwater pond and branches were hovering above it and just over the surface. I saw these, I decided to get up earlier than normal and go to the pond and the sun was just coming up through the trees at a certain angle. If I wasn't there when that light was shining that way, I would never have seen the spider webs. So I realized that um, there's so much we don't see, there's so much we don't know. Uh, and you have to be there to see it. Uh, and I love not having a plan, but having maybe idea of where I'm going to go uh, because it's just, I love what um, the photographer John Gossage had said once to me. He said, you know, I figure the world knows more than I do. And that's sort of my approach as well. Um, I'd also like to say some of the influences for my work um, in photography, um, a major mentor of mine was Terry Weifenbach, who was a DC, in DC for many years and now lives in Paris, uh, France. Um, and I was heavily influenced by her work um, and uh, also the work of Saul Leiter, um, Barbara Bosworth, Jem Southam. Um, there are a number of other photographers whose work I really, really love. Um, I think the early influences though were my mother's paintings and color. Uh, she was trained at the Massachusetts College of Art. And um, I remember growing up just seeing color in her studio and um, not being very patient at the time. I always wanted to go outside and play, but you know, looking and seeing her put the brush strokes on the canvas. Um, and I, it must have stuck with me because I think there was a bit of fascination at the time, but not patience. Um, and my father, who was a, um, a biologist, would take us on hikes in the woods. And I learned the appreciation of nature, uh, different plants, different leaves we would see, identifying them, uh, the scents, uh, the, the, uh, really the details of things that can distinguish one from another. Um, and I just love how they've come together uh, in my work, especially in this body of work. Um, I'll end with this photograph of, um, it's again, I'm drawn to water. So the stormwater pond, uh, um, I'm drawn to it because the water is fairly still. And I was fascinated by the layers of it. The, underneath the water, you can, I, I try to focus underneath on the leaves that are decomposing and um, let the reflections and the pollen that had fallen on top and the shadows and the color become this layered approach. I've always felt this sense of, of weaving in my work, weaving a life, um, weaving a photograph. Uh, and I feel like this one has a sense of whole to it. Um, and 
it reminds me of my experience photographing for my second photo book, which was uh, Deep Time. It focuses on the life of the horseshoe crab. And I, at one point, I got an artist residency to, um, in Delaware to uh, be in a laboratory and use microscopes to photograph horseshoe crab embryos. And it was difficult. Um, any slight movement of the focusing mechanism would it was extremely shallow depth of field. You get a completely different uh, view. And I was just so surprised with that. And it, you know, after a while, you realize there's so many different ways to see something. And I was playing with that in this image. I have other photographs of it where most of it is blurred and only a small part, excuse me, is in focus. Um, but I, did, I chose this one for the exhibition because I think you can see most of the layers in it. Um, yeah, so I'd like to end with this and um, to, let's see, if there's anything I'm missing. Yeah, I guess for the exhibition, I did wanna mention, I sequenced it in a way that can be viewed from uh, right to left and left to right. Um, it, it would have a different beginning and a different ending. And there's a journey in the middle. Um, I just liked the idea that the viewer can choose how they would like to, to move through the space and view the work. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's about it. And yeah, oh, this, so I'm not really finished photographing. This will become my next photo book. Hopefully I can publish it in, in 2023. Um, I have, um, when looking at my work, I have some areas that I want to explore that would, I feel, make it feel more complete. Um, but again, it's almost there, nearly there. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. And I'm excited to see the photo book of this collection, especially after getting the first impression being in the gallery, in the exhibit. So yeah. um, thank, thank you, you again. very much. Uh -huh. So our last artist to speak today is going to be Heather Goodchild. Um, Heather is a Canadian multidisciplinary artist. Um, since 2001, she's actually exhibited both in Canada, Berlin, Miami, New York, um, and of course, DC now, this being her first introduction to the DC area. So we were so grateful to have her here. Um, so today she'll be talking about her current exhibit, Violet Peach. So. Heather, if you want to take it away. Sure, thanks, Cassie, and thank you to International Arts and Artists at Hillier and uh, the whole team. Um, it was amazing to come down and meet everyone, and thank you for so much support in putting the show together. Um, I'm going to share my screen and do a, let's see, fantastic. Okay, to start, I'm just going to do a quick overview of my past um, work to give some context to um, the current exhibition, Violet Peach. Uh, so I uh, didn't train at an art school. I trained actually um, in Toronto for fashion and I, my ambition was to be a costume designer. So in the early 2000s, I began working doing theater, film and uh, stop motion television costume work. Um, this is just sort of like a little bit of background. And I quickly realized that this was not for me um, and started doing art exhibitions kind of as a hobby. Um, I was very interested in uh, traditional folk music, Victoriana. I started making these felt portraits. Um, I was reluctant to paint. I never wanted to paint because I felt because I trained as a textile person that I had to work in textiles. So these are felt that has been pieced together and stained with watercolor to make these faces. Um, so I, I found these faces and I, I imagined that they were the heroines or the victims of these songs that I would then embroider. Um, it was a whole process. And from there, I went on to create installation work around these folk songs, again, storytelling. This is where I started uh, making hooked rugs, which has become one of the main aspects of my practice. Um, so for this exhibition, I, I had four rooms in which um, the interiors, the decorative arts told the story. Um, and this sort of 
collapsing the hierarchy between uh, artistic disciplines has followed through the rest of my career, starting here. Um, here, again, I'm working in textiles. I made this giant quilt, but I was trying to also tell a story. And this is sort of almost like an emergence from Eden and the animals um, as they leave uh, and get further away from the quilt, they become more human-like. So it goes from being very like rabbits or dogs into um, almost like people crawling. And I want to include this because I feel like uh, a work, Ghost Dogs, in the current exhibition kind of harkens back to 2007, which is a long time ago. Um, from there, I started making this body of work called The Wardens. It was based around uh, this fictitious ladies organization I invented that I thought of as from the late 19th century, kind of uh, like a, a ladies Freemasonry. And through it, I was kind of trying to figure out um, my own moral compass, my own um, sort of religion in a way, because I didn't grow up with within a religious context and I was always fascinated by, by it. So I started making these artifacts for this fictitious organization and I wanted people to sort of encounter them and take away what they would, as, as I you know, would encounter a church and look at mysterious symbols and not quite know what was going on. So I, I had an idea of what was happening but I wanted it to be a little bit opaque to the viewer so that they could um, take, take their own idea away from what they were seeing. My idea with this tent, it was this room filling installation, was that these ladies would come to towns and put up this tent and people would walk through it in the uh, late 19th century. It was very elaborate, this whole story. So what follows are some of the works that were in, in these, these tents. This is a hooked rug. Uh, it's based on Joseph Campbell's um, hero myth, except through a, a, a feminist lens. Um, it's about uh, leaving your community in order to follow your bliss and sort of the journey along the way. Um, this is again on the left, another iteration of that. And then this is uh, the, the wheel. It's, it's linked to the wheel of fortune as well as um, sort of the job wheel of the ladies organization. I was really interested in how through work, you could improve your mental health because I felt like all of this craft, repetitive work was in a way, um, a way for me to um, bring calm to my life. I found it necessary. And so that was kind of a tenant of the organization through work, find um, peace. Uh, here are more scenes that were within the tent. Um, I was really looking to biblical stories, but reinterpreting them. Um, so in the one on the left, it's kind of like the coming of spring, but also the Lamb of God with the Wheel of Fortune. So the tarot meeting, Christianity meeting, um, other uh, religious storytelling or and, and fairy tale folk, folk tales. Um, here again, these animals show up. They, they have now become ceramic. So originally in 2007, they were felt. And in this one, I created uh, slip cast ceramic uh, creatures. And I, I think for me, they, they became something to do with fertility, masculinity, um, sort of the force of nature within this show. Uh, again, this is a textile felt piece, another artifact from the wardens. Um, organization, the balanced life will flourish. Uh, and then from, from there, I started to uh, let go a bit of the storytelling and the rigid structure of this organization and be a little bit more free with my imagery and to use more moments, emotional moments in my life to inspire these fantastical, um, rugs. So this is one of them and this is another one. This is sort of based on Moses up on the mountain but it's also about um, being an outsider, being a, a monster and the people below are afraid of it but then the monster is actually um, 
afraid of this flower, um, the force of the universe uh, to its right. Um, again, I ca carried on making these room filling installations. These are three feet high figures. And this piece is about climate change actually. Uh, but again, I'm using kind of these Warden's ladies, these Victorian ladies um, to tell this story of, they're, they're supposed to be on the detritus at the end of the world, sort of alluding to the, ra the raft of the Medusa. And the woman at the top is, is supposed to be plugging this dripping hole that's flooded the world. Anyways, I'm not sure uh, this, this work kind of dead ended for me a bit. Um, I also around this time did this massive performance piece through the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, in which I had 75 volunteers do a 12 hour performance. Um, it's for a, an event we have Nuit Blanche overnight in which uh, we manufactured uh, stools, jackets, posters and ceramic mugs. So I wanted to have sort of these traditional materials people working together, there were songs, it was very elaborate. Um, and I feel like both the, the performance and the uh, room filling installations I could have carried into different careers, but um, I didn't, I started painting. Um, and then I, 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 I couldn't stop. So painting really uh, Took over, took over my life. I started because I did a residency in Paris and um, I couldn't do any of these other things that I used to do so while I was there because uh, you know I didn't have access to all the materials. So I started painting and then I, I kind of felt like it was the right direction for me. Um, so I've carried on with that since 2016 as well as the hooked rugs which are um, I find a nice counterpoint. So here are some of my earlier paintings in watercolor. Um, using moments from my life, using photographic reference. Uh, these, and I also got into oil painting. These are more recent. Um, I find with the paintings, it's like, I think I'm still seeking that magic that I was trying to decode within all that storytelling in the ladies organization, but instead I'm just capturing moments in my life that I see and, and where I find a light that somehow reveals, um, I don't know, some kind of ineffable experience that uh, kind of links in with that other thing I was seeking. Uh, I also started painting from life, which I also find uh, exhilarating. Um, and you see in this, these two pieces, the one on the left is a painting from life I did at a residency in uh, California. And the rug on the right is a, um, from the same time using the experience of the residency and using the sort of paintings I made there for the colorway. So how the textile and the painting influence each other. Um, again, here's how my textile work and my painting work influence and inspire each other. We'll just move quickly because I know it's like getting on. Um, again, here, and this, this comes up in Violet Peach. And you see, then I, I slip up and I start making ceramics again, but here are uh, a rug based on a painting. And then I ended up making ceramics in the same style because the original reference um, vessel inspired me so much. Uh, I love capturing the movement of painting within hooked rug um, to have the immediacy within this very time consuming medium. Um, and also how in still life, you can sort of find emotional storytelling um, through the objects. As I was being much more literal in my early career, now the, the emotional feelings, the colors are, are telling the tale. Uh, here's just some more uh, rugs. And now we'll get to Violet Peach. Uh, so for this um, installation, uh, when I was originally invited, they, um, I, I had just wanted to show paintings. However, um, 
the board was more interested in the installation work. So I, I, I've been excited and really enjoyed bringing a little of the installation aspect back into my work for this exhibition. It's been really exciting. Um, so I'm going to take you through the, the, I created three different rooms within the gallery. In the first room, uh, you encounter this tiny oil painting. And I, I see this as this, the dreamer, the person having a dream, and you encounter this rug. And this is where those animals from my earlier career kind of reappear. And I see this rug as a dream. Um, I started it around the time um, when the, the war in Ukraine started. And I was thinking about uh, a war, but also this, because it's a dream, the war has, has entered into this sort of bucolic landscape with hydrangeas and um, garden plants, but then the red is almost like muscle or blood. Um, and here we have the, the spilling blood from a chalice and um, a dagger or sword, which also allude to the tarot in my earlier work, as does this gateway, which speaks to going into the, the dreamscape and the latter entering a new um, state of consciousness. Uh, from this room, um, you enter through curtains into a, a room completely covered with this pattern. The pattern is called Violet Peach, and you can see the pattern is in this rug. And I like that idea of, of, an, of a, a motif or a pattern repeating but shifting and changing and how that happens within the dreamscape and, and things you see in your life then are there, but they're slightly different. Um, this rug is about, I mean, it's about a lot of things, but it's, it's based on a pile of fabric I had on a carpet. And I, tr I, I combined it with this painting I had of, of two people who had um, met in a previous life. So it's them in this life and them in the reincarnation. So this again, I feel like is within this dream world or in a different state of consciousness. Uh, also within this room with the pattern, uh, you find this uh, gouache sketch, which I did from life in my garden, which I then uh, translated into this hooked rug. Um, so this hooked rug leads us into the third room uh, in which you encounter this figure and the whole room is in half scale. So the paintings are actually hung low. Um, and when you enter it, the viewer feels oversized and out of place as you sometimes do in a dream. And you can see here the actual scale. Um, and the paintings that the figure is looking at are all, again, moments from my life where they're mundane. I didn't want them to be fantastical like the rugs. I wanted them to be things that people would recognize or things they had seen. This is a gallery cafeteria on the subway at a restaurant at someone's house but within each of them there's sort of some kind of magic light or glimmer of the other the crack into the the other realm of of, of fantasy uh, and these are some of the other paintings within the room um, for for me violet peach as a whole uh, is about the last two, two years within the pandemic and how, because of the routine was, was, my normal routine was changed and day to day was so similar. I found my, my dreams and my reality and my digital experiences, my experiences online with people somehow collapsed to a point where I kind of didn't know what was real and what was, um, a memory or what was a dream. And uh, for this exhibition, I want to sort of give the viewer that feeling of uncertainty of, about what their state of consciousness is. Well, thank you, Heather, so much. You're welcome. So I know we only have a couple minutes left, but I still want to offer this opportunity for um, Amity to leave the Q&A 
um, for all three of our artists while we have them here. So I'm gonna leave it to Amity to um, propose any of the questions that were sent to her. The first one is for uh, Jeremy. Um, someone asked, uh, is there a specific meaning behind the use of lawn chair in your work? So there is. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually plan on hitting on, on that, but I, I skipped over it in my notes. Um, yeah, so the lawn chair for me, it, it comes out of the socioeconomic background in which I, I grew up in. So it, it wasn't uncommon to see these chairs on someone's front lawn or, and have them, you know, cracking a couple beers and people watching every day. Um, so it came out of that, but it also came through in terms of what I call claiming space. So taking that chair, identifying it as part of myself, part of my upbringing, part of my culture and owning that. And I started to take that idea from um, in Baltimore and I'm not, I can't speak to other cities because when I lived in Philly, they did it a little bit, but not really. But when it snows, you take two of those lawn chairs, you, you put them in your parking spot. No one's gonna park there, that's yours. So it's a little kind of funny aspect, but also it's claiming that space. So for me, it's owning that heritage of where I grew up. And it's also a, a, a kind of mix of presence and absence. So I used to paint a lot of empty chairs in general, but um, the chair itself, it, it's kind of figurative in its own presence, but yet it alludes to the presence of a human being, but yet no one's there. So, so that, that duality, once again. Someone asked, uh, all of your works have a painterly quality about them. What painter have had the most influence on your work? I'd like to kind of throw out, um, from my own recent experience in the woods, um, Alexander Calder uh, came to mind, and so did Paul Clay, taking a line for a walk, and the color and his um, the influence of music on his painting. Um, I experienced a lot of that in, in the woods. Um, that's just more recent influences, yeah. Okay, I'll go for it. Um, I know Tim and I were talking about John Singer Sargent. Uh, lo love him and uh, of course Manet. Um, I love the Dutch masters. Um, and uh, I, I, in my formative years, I was really into the surrealists, which I think is, you know, I rejected them, but now it's all coming back, so. I would say the the majority of my influence in general comes from Francis Bacon, artists like more contemporary artists such as Justin Mortimer or Adrian Genye. Um, but there's a lot of my work that comes from, in terms of painters in general, a lot of unnamed painters. So I worked as a sign painter for a while. So that aspect of that kind of cleanness and that smoothness and that advertisement aspect flows into the work. Um, but originally who, who captivated me the most was Caravaggio. Um, and I was in Florence and uh, Venice a couple of weeks ago. So just seeing those in person and, and Artemidia Janileski, um, bringing those artists, that drama into the work um, as well as Mark Rothko. So the whole gamut actually from figuration to abstraction, all it just kind of feeds into whatever I'm doing. Well, thank you all so much for participating in this artist discussion. Um, I can say personally, it's just amazing hearing the insights that you all bring into your works, the behind the scenes, um, upcoming projects. I'm hoping to stay in touch to see more about those because I'm just inspired by them. Um, and then for the audience, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know some people are here at 11 p.m. at night on their time, so we appreciate the dedication. Um, so thank you all so much. It's a true honor to see all the people supporting the artists. And Tim, if there's anything else you want to add. I just would like to take this time to thank the artists for taking the time to share their thoughts uh, about their work and their life experiences. Thanks for making the month of August enriching, thought provoking, and inspiring. Uh, coincidentally, we are currently accepting artist proposals for 2023. Uh, we hope that those artists will bring the same level of talent and ingenuity as you have demonstrated today. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for participating in the program and have a great afternoon. Thank you. We'll see you all next time. <laughs>
Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. Bye. Bye.